Hello everybody, how are you today? Welcome for IELTS, Cambridge and TOEFL certification classes. My name is Rodrigo and I'm officially a Cambridge examiner for the speaking part of the test. But before we start our class today, make sure that you subscribe to my channel. All you have to do is to click on the link below. So this way you can watch all my grammar and vocabulary tips for next classes, alright? And the topic of the day is a very advanced one. It belongs to C1 and C2 levels of the Common European Framework Database. And it's called Figurative Language. Basically, Figurative Language can be used for both speaking and writing. So, in other words, it could be both formal and informal. It depends on what kind of figurative language you're using, alright? And I really would like you to take all my tips before you write your text because this way you can learn what can be used in terms of register. It's kind of negative when you mix a very high degree of formality with a low degree of formality in the same paragraph. And your marks can be deducted because of that. And for this reason, I'm teaching you the imperial figurative language is existent in grammar language, all right? So, not all the names are similar in all languages, so I'm teaching you the English terms, but perhaps in your language, whoever is watching this video, the terms will have a different name, all right? So don't worry about that, just really focus and pay attention at the English term you are going to learn. And the first one is simile. Repeat, please. Simile. Basically, the word simile means a comparison of expression by the usage of as or like. That's it. For instance, if you say, Mary was as brave as a lion, you are comparing how brave Mary was, so as brave as a lion. We know that's an exaggeration, because lions are much braver than people, but, you know, simile has exactly this function, all right? The second example, he is as funny as a bearer of monkeys. Again, I'm comparing how funny he is compared to monkeys. And your explanation is as clear as mud. And in this case, specifically, I'm being sarcastic because mud is not clear, all right? Excellent, so this first one was simile, all right? Now, let's move to the figurative language number two, oxymoron. Again, oxymoron, which basically means when two words with opposite meanings are used together, you know? Some people can be really confused because they're using two opposite meanings in the same sentence. Example number one, John was clearly confused. <laughs> so if he was confused, how is it possible to be clearly, you know? Like, clearly is the opposite of confused, and they're used together, right? Another example, just act naturally. If you're acting, that cannot be natural, because that's a fake. So again, that's called oxymoron in language. Another example, the firm was really normal this morning. So if it was normal, how is it possible to be weird? Understand, so they are opposites, weirdly normal this morning. You weird is the opposite of normal, okay? And the last one, just answer the questions in a random order. <laughs> if there is an order, that's not random. Because random means it has no order. So, in a random order, again, we use a feature called oxymoron in English language. Alright? So, let's move to language number three, which is a metaphor. Perhaps one of the most common figurative languages in English. And basically, we describe a person or an object by referring to something that has similar characteristics to that person or to that object. It's easier to see some examples, right? So, John's suggestion was just a band-aid for the problem. Band-aid is a very common word in the whole world, so everybody knows what band-aid is. So his suggestion was a band-aid for the problem. It means that it has covered the problem. It has solved the problem temporarily. You understand? 
Second example, laughter is the music of the soul. So we know that laughter is not music, but it's the music of the soul. It sounds like music when you laugh, right? It's a metaphor. In the last example, her lovely voice was music to his ears. Again, her voice is not music when, he, when she speaks, but it was music to his ears because he felt relieved when he heard her voice. Do you understand? Right? So that's called metaphor. Let's move to number four. Metonymy. Again, let's repeat it. Metonymy. Basically, when we refer to something using a word that describes its qualities or features, or in other words, it replaces the name of a thing with the name of something else which is very, very closely associated to it. For example, when you say, I read Agatha Christie, basically what you meant to say is that you read a book that was written by Agatha Christie. But everybody says, oh, I read Agatha Christie yesterday. They read the book. Another example, I drank a glass of milk. No, you cannot drink a glass. So what you drank was the content of the glass. So you drank a glass of milk. So what you actually drank was the milk, the liquid, and not the glass. And that in English has a special name. It's called metonymy. All right. Excellent. So let's move to the next one. Catacrasis. So basically, when we associate parts of our body to objects and vice versa, all right, it's called catacrasis. For example, the chair's legs are broken. We know that what goes under the chair to sustain the chair. They're not legs. Legs is what we have in our bodies, what animals have in their bodies, but we call the chair's legs. We are using a human's body part on a chair. In the second example, I need to replace my bed's feet. Again, feet is used for people and animals. They're not used for objects, but in this case, we are lending our body part to an object, and that's called in English catacrasis, all right? That's the formal name we give to that. Next one, hyperbole. Hyperbole is basically an exaggeration or over-exaggeration. So when you say, he's running faster than the wind, we know that's impossible. Everybody knows that it's impossible to run faster than the wind, but this exaggeration means that he's running the fastest he can, all right? Second example, his bag weighs a ton. Of course his bag doesn't weigh a ton, but the impression you have when you try to carry the bag is that it's so heavy that it weighs a ton, all right? Another example, that man is as tall as a house. No man in the world are as tall as a house, but we're exaggerating here, you understand? In the last example, this is the worst day of my life. There are many times you probably just said that. Today was the worst day of my life. You've probably had worse days than this one, right? So hyperbole is the exaggeration when we speak, right? Now let's move to personification. Personification is when a thing or an idea is given human attributes. So, parts of humans, humans' personalities and attributes. For example, when you say lightning danced across the sky. Lightning that cannot dance. So, when you say lightning danced across the sky, you are giving a human attribute, which is to dance. Second example, the car complained as the key was roughly turned in its ignition. The car cannot complain because it doesn't have a mouth. But we use that language to say that the car probably made a weird noise when the key was roughly turned in its ignition, you know? And the last example, my alarm clock yells at me to get out of bed every morning. 
And again, we know alarm clocks don't yell because that's a human's character. It's a human attribution, okay? So in this case, what we're doing now, we're using a personification, all right? So that was the figurative language we just used. Now, let's move on to alliteration, which basically is a repetition of the same consonant sounds all the time. So let's see the first sentence. Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. <laughs> so we've repeated the P, 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 P. We repeated a lot of consonants in the sentence. A good cook could cook as much cookies as a good cook who would cook good cookies. So it's really weird to say that. Repeating the G, repeating the C, repeating the G, repeating the C, you know? And black bug beat a big black bag. So again, all the bees, black, bug, big, big, black, bear, six bees in a row. So that's what we call alliteration, and that should definitely, definitely be avoided in writing, okay? Now, the next one, understatement, is when you try to make something less important, or less strong, or to sound less bad, you know, than what it really is. For example, He's not too thin. <laughs> you know he's obese. So instead of saying he's very fat, you say, well, he's not too thin. You know? You are minimizing, you are softening the situation. The second example, it rained a bit more than usual. <laughs> when you're describing an area being flooded by heavy rainfall. So there's a lot of flood, a lot of rain, and you're saying, well, it rained a bit more than usual. You know, you are saying, uh, again, you are softening the real situation. And you say, oh, it was okay. Said by a student who got the highest score on the test. So the guy aced the test. He was supposed to have said, oh, I, I've done fantastic on the test. But he said, oh, it was okay. You know? So he was minimizing, he was softening the reality, which is to do fantastic in the test. Okay? Next one, onomatopoeia. Again, onomatopoeia. When you use words that include similar sounds to the noise the words refers to. All right? To the words referred to. Okay? So you say the buzzing bee flew away. Buzz is the sound of a bee. So the buzzing bee flew away. So you're using the sound of a bee to say what the bee did. The sack fell into the river with a splash. And splash is the noise of water spreading all over. A meow is a vocalization of cats. So every time cats wants to talk to people, they say meow, which is the sound. So the sound of animals, the vocalization of animals are called onomatopoeia. Right? That's the name we give in English. Let's move to the next one. Imagery. Again, imagery. Basically, it's used a uh, word to play with our five senses, like our listening, our smell, our taste, our touch, and our view. The five senses we have, okay? So let's see the first example. It was dark and dim in the forest. So the words dark and dim are visual images. The children were screaming and shouting in the fields. So again, screaming and shouting appeal to our sense of hearing or auditory sense. They whiffed the aroma of brewed coffee. Whiff and aroma evoke our sense of smell, our olfactory sense. Okay? The girl ran her hands on a soft satin fabric. So the idea of soft in this example appeals to our sense of touch or tactile sense. Okay? So in other words, we are using our senses, and that's called in English imagery. Alright? So let's move to the next one here. Um, now, next one. A cliche. As the nom says, so a cliché is the overuse of the words or the sentence. 
So everybody knows because it has become popular, right? So just to give an example, because there are so many cliches. So when we are describing time, the following expressions have turned into cliché. When you say in the nick of time, to happen just in time, you know. So you say in the nick of time he arrived to catch his train, all right? Just in time. Only time will tell to become clear over time. So only time will tell. It's a very cliché sentence. It's a matter of time. That's gonna happen sooner or later. And at the speed of light, to do something very quickly. Again, we are using expressions of time as cliché. We could spend the whole afternoon using clichés here, but probably that's the easiest part of clichés. So I think that was enough for us to understand. Okay. Next one, anaphora, which is the deliberate repetition of a part of the sentence. Okay? So we do that on purpose. We repeat on purpose parts of sentences. So I say to you, every day, every night, in every way, I'm getting better and better. So I repeated every, every, every on purpose, deliberately. Okay? Second example. Buying diapers for the baby, feeding the baby, playing with the baby. This water life is when you have a baby. So again, we're repeating baby, 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 baby deliberately. Okay? And the last example, the wrong person was selected for the wrong job at the wrong time for the wrong purpose. Okay? So again, I use the adjective wrong repeatedly, and that's called in English anaphora. Okay? So we did that on purpose. Next one is Zilma, which basically is easy to omit the previous verb, so you let out the previous verb, okay? For example, my father was American, my grandfather Russian, my mom Spanish, and my grandmother Greek. In other words, I don't need to say, my father was American, and my grandmother was Russian, and my mom was Spanish, and my grandmother was Greek. We don't need to repeat the verb to be all the time. So, by eliminating the previous verb, I'm using a sigma, alright? Another example. History is making men wise. Poets, witty. The mathematics, subtle. Natural philosophy, deep. Moral, grave. Logic and rhetoric, able to comprehend. In this case, I'm eliminating the use of the verb to make. Like, histories make men wise. Poets make men witty. The mathematics make men subtle. Natural make well, philosophy deep. So, we don't need to use make, 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 make. So when we eliminate the previous verb, that in English is called zilgma. That's the right name. Okay? Next figurative is the asyndeton. Repeat please, asyndeton, which is used to eliminate or leave out conjunctions. In this case, we do not use conjunctions. So we do, we do not need to link our nouns. So he eats, reads, cooks, sleeps, drinks. That's all it does. You know, so when you're complaining about something, it's very common to use a sentence. Because you say everything that a person does, and they don't need to connect, because there are many things to be said in a row, you know? So all she does is studying, reading, eating, waking up, having a shower, feeding the cat. So you're giving a sequence of events, and that's in English, because you're not using conjunctions, you're not linking your words, it's called a syndeton, okay? That's the formal name we give to that. Next one, anadiplosis. So, anadiplosis is the repetition of words in successive clauses in such a way that the second clause starts with the same word that the previous clause is finished. So, we are going to repeat the finish the last word of the previous sentence and you're going to start the new sentence with that word. So you're going to be repeating and repeating and repeating. So let me give an example. 
You must make an effort to support our faith with goodness, and goodness with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with endurance, and endurance with godliness, and godliness with mutual affection, and mutual affection with love. So, you're using the last word of the previous sentence to start the new sentence, okay? That's what you do. And that in English is called anandiplosis, all right? We're almost done. So, the penultimate word of the day is chiasmus. Basically, it happens when two clauses balance against each other by the reversal of their structures. So, by the inverse of their structures. So let's see the example. Never let a fool kiss you or a kiss fool you. So I inverted a fool kiss you by a kiss fool you. You know, that's the reversal of the previous sentence. Next example. You forget what you want to remember and you remember what you want to forget. It's a classical, right? Another example. Do I love you because you're beautiful, or are you beautiful because I love you? So I'm using the reversal of the previous sentence. And when I do that in English, it's called chiasmus, right? And the last figurative language of the day is pleonasm. So pleonasm is the overuse of more words than are needed in the sentence, in order to express a meaning. In other words, you're not supposed to use more words than necessary, you know? It's a bad thing, it's a negative thing to do to our text. So please, let's avoid pleonasm. That's really, really bad. So let's see some examples. Receive a free gift with every purchase. So, I wrote in Portuguese, like an example for our Brazilian students. Um presente sempre de graça, então não precisaria do free antes do gift. So basically, a gift is always for free. So we don't need the free to represent a gift, because if you gave something to somebody, that's a gift, all right? The plumber fixed out hot, wa uh, hot water heater. Hot is already uh, used to heat something. So it's an exaggeration to use hot and heater in the same sentence, all right? He entered into the room. Obviously, if he entered, it was into the room. He cannot enter outside the room. You understand? And he raised up his hands in a gesture of surrender. If he raised his hands, the only way of raising is to put your hands up. So, you cannot put your hands down if you're raising your hands. So, again, you're using more than the necessary words to build your sentence. And that, in English, is called... Leonardo. All right, guys? So, thank you so much for being with me in this class. I know it's kind of difficult. It's very advanced grammar. But, again, I'm trying to help you with your writing skills. And I really hope you pass at Cambridge C1, C2 levels, TOEFL 110 to 120 points or marks, and your IELTS with 8 or 9, okay? Again, my name is Rodrigo. If you haven't subscribed yet, please click on the link below and make sure you follow our classes next time, alright? So, thank you so much. Cheers! Bye-bye!